It's so great to be here and it's so great to see so many friendly and familiar faces. Um, thank you, Mafe and Thomas, for inviting me to speak about the Muse. Thank you, Creative Mornings, for putting on this incredible spread. And thank you, Slack, for hosting. Uh, where are my notes? There we go. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to share with you guys um, my thoughts about the Muse. And this was really an opportunity for me to explore where the Muse shows up in my work. And I really want to thank you for giving me the chance, because oftentimes I just make the work and don't really think back about where the inspiration comes from. So putting this show together allowed me to figure that out. And what I just, ooh, the wrong way. <laughs> so what I discovered was that the muse, for me, shows up as the intuition that guides me through the process of making. Um, so I've been a designer for 15 years, and I started discovering photography because I was really passionate about making images to explore ideas. And what I learned once I got my feet under me and understanding how to work with photography is that design gave me a huge foundation to stand on. So it gave me the comfort that not knowing is okay, not knowing your end product is going to be okay. Um, the intuition, the, the trust that the process is going to lead you to someplace good. And also um, that mistakes are really important because oftentimes you can't see what's right until you make something that's obviously wrong. The other thing that design taught me was how to compose a really nice picture and how to use negative space and how to balance out objects in a frame. Design also gave me a brief, but making your own art doesn't give you a brief. So how do you how do you start? What do you ask? And really, when you're making your own work, you're answering your own questions. So I wanted to frame this talk with this quote, and I'll read it aloud. The hardest part is setting the camera on the tripod, or making the decision to bring the camera out of the car, or just raising the camera to your face, believing by those actions that whatever you find before you, whatever you find there, is going to be good, by Sally Mann. So for those of you who don't know who Sally Mann is, she is an American photographer. She had her first show, museum show, uh, in 1977. She's 68 years old now. And I find this quote incredibly reassuring that an artist at her stage of her career, she wrote this, this was in her book, Hold Still, uh, that was published in 2016. And at this point in her career, the fact that she was able to admit that she still doesn't know what she's going to make when she puts the camera to her face, and she's trusting her intuition to guide her, I find incredibly reassuring. So when I think about what inspires Sally Mann and what inspires me, um, when I look at her work, she really, she stays close to home. So she photographed her family and her environment and things around her that felt intimate. And when I looked back at my work and saw what was inspiring me, to me, everything came from my day-to-day -day life. So today I'm going to share with you two projects for my day-to-day -day life, um, and inspired by just a sense of curiosity. And actually, the two projects I'm going to talk about, the topics weren't really interesting to me until I started exploring them further. So the first project originates here at the red Google dot in Latvia, Riga, Latvia, which is where I was born, and where my parents and I emigrated from when I was six years old. And because we were refugees, we traveled through a path that was sponsored by the United States. And we went through Austria for a few weeks, and then Italy for a few months, and lived in collective housing, and waited for our sponsorship to be approved so we could move to Teaneck, New Jersey. So once we got to Teaneck, New Jersey, um, we had no language, we had no money, and our relatives lived in Brighton in Brooklyn, and we didn't have a car. So we felt pretty isolated. But my parents really encouraged me to learn English really quickly, which I did. And as, I, as soon as I learned, I really wanted to become American, and they encouraged me. And the way I did it was just observation. And I think this is where I developed my skills as an observer, because I just had to learn how to do something that I had no idea how with no language. So um, the main thing that I noticed as in this experience of my childhood and growing up with these two different spaces were how different my home life was, was with my experience outside of school, in school. And we didn't bring a lot of things with us from the Soviet Union, but we did bring a lot of photographs. And I would pour over these photographs so often 
And even today when I look at them, um, that little chubby kid with the hat, the two kids, that one's me. And <laughs> I can't, and they're my grandparents and my parents in these photographs, and I can't believe this is where I came from, that this was my childhood. And it still blows me away to look at these pictures and think about that was my life. So these photographs really also started to talk to me, and I was inspired by them. And the first opportunity I had to work with them was doing this book. It was a memoir that my grandmother wrote when she was in her late 70s. And she wrote about her time. She was born 12 years after the Russian Revolution, and she wrote about her experience at that time. So I used the pictures I just showed you to illustrate this book. And when I finished, I was really grateful this, for this experience and really grateful to share it with my family. And I felt like I had used my design skills in a way that was really meaningful. But I still felt like these pictures had more to tell me. And I wanted to explore them more. And I was looking, I was making collages with them. I was trying to draw them or paint them. And nothing felt right. So I put them away for a little while. At the same time, I was working with a friend of mine who is a pastry chef, and I was shooting food photography. And she kept asking me, what's the food that you want to shoot? Knowing that I loved food, that I had every subscription to every food magazine, a huge extensive collection of cookbooks, and I couldn't think of anything except food from my childhood, which I didn't like. So, <laughs> so I kept thinking, gosh, this is the only thing I want to photograph that's so strange. And then I looked back at these photos and something clicked when I looked at this picture. So my grandfather's on the left, my grandmother has my mom sitting on her lap, and this is just a really typical Soviet scene, and I think it's typical for a lot of families just to gather around the table and tell stories and share life. And something about this picture really spoke to me. There was a connection between my memory of my history and the food from my childhood. And all of the social interactions in my family really happened like this. The first time I went out to dinner at a restaurant, I was in high school and had no idea what to do. I had never had that experience before. So again, my powers of observation, I quickly had to learn how to, what the heck I was supposed to do. So this photograph really sparked the idea of wanting to make a project around food and memory. And I didn't know exactly what it was. But the first thing I did was I called my mom because I wanted these images that I made to be rooted in something from my childhood, something real. So I asked her for, to send as many dishes and silverware and textiles as she could spare. So she put them in a box and sent them to me in San Francisco. And then I also wanted these images to be about memory and not be commercial food photography. So I looked at how art was represented, um, how food was represented in art, and really studied how to create a tone with images. And then I started with what I knew best, myself. And this is uh, what a Soviet kindergarten picture looks like. <laughs> it looks very serious, and I look like I'm about to report the evening news. <laughs> but contrary to what the picture looks like, I was a really happy kid at that time. And I had really warm memories of running to my grandmother's house every day after school, and she'd always have toys and candy, and it was just warm and full of love. And when I think about the type of picture I wanted to make, it was definitely going to be around sweets. So this is the f one of the first pictures that I took. And these, this chocolate company is still around in Moscow today, making the same chocolates with the same wrappers. And kids would always dig through candy bowls looking for their favorite um, wrappers. The illustrations would be cows and bears and babies, and you know which one you loved and dig for it. So when I set out to take this picture, I wanted it to have a warmth to it. And I used the actual dish that my grandmother served these candies in, because I really wanted it to be grounded in something real. And I wanted it to evoke that feeling that I had when I was a kid. This photograph, <coughs> excuse me, my grandfather stands on the left which, with what I assume are two of his comrades from work. And my grandparents moved to the United States six months after we did. And my grandfather was a really proud man, and he had a really hard time adjusting to the United States. He couldn't learn the language. He couldn't have, get a job. He was an engineer at a factory in the Soviet Union. He had a huge team of people under, under him. And 
he just, he really didn't want to move. So when they moved, because we did, they kind of had to, um, he, was, he struggled. And because by the time they got there, my mom had a job, my dad had a job, and my grandmother quickly got a job, he became my de facto babysitter. So every morning, he would make me breakfast. And this breakfast was kasha. And for those of you who don't know what kasha is, which I'm assuming is most of you, it's a uh, buckwheat cereal. When you cook it, it smells really, really pungent. And I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And put tons of brown sugar on it and butter, and I still hated it. But I had no choice. This is what he was making me. I think, like, I know my grandfather loved me, but I don't think he liked me very much. <laughs> he didn't really care what he was serving me for breakfast. He was making it, so I was going to eat it. So when I was making this picture, I think this is one of those things that I didn't intend to do when I set out to make it, but there's a feeling of sadness and loneliness in this photograph, and I think that's some of the feelings I had with my experience with him and his experience with me. So again, this is my intuition guiding me. I didn't know how to make this or what I was making, but I was making it until it felt right. My grandmother, on the other hand, was incredibly excited to move to the United States, and she really embraced it. She learned the language really quickly, she got a job fast, and um, she actually stayed employed there until she retired. And her main skill was that she was able to make really simple things feel incredibly special. So one of the dishes that I think of when I think of her are these marinated mushrooms. And the Russians have a real affinity for mushrooms. Foraging is a bit of a pastime, and uh, chanterelles and porcinis are usually the mushrooms that you use to make this dish. But when we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey, they were white button mushrooms, and they came in a styrofoam box. <laughs> so she had a little bit less to work with. But she still made it really special. And this dish appeared in this actual bowl at my family table for almost every celebration that I can remember. And when I set out to make this picture, I really wanted it to feel special. I wanted it to feel like a simple ingredient being elevated, and also that feeling that she brought to the food that she made. So this image is my grandfather on the left, his father, my great-grandfather in the middle, and this mysterious man who appears in both my mom's side of the photos and my dad's side of the Russian photos. And he's a known member of the KGB. Apparently he was married somehow to somebody in one family and by marriage connected to the other. And I love this photograph. I love the dingy interior. I love the, form, the contrast of their formal clothing. I love the plastic tablecloth on top of the table. And it feels very much reminiscent of what interior life looked like at my house, just people hanging out and sitting around and being at home together. So I thought, what would they eat? And it was this pickled herring dish that's really easy. It's zakuski, which means snacks in Russian. And this is the first image that helped me understand what it was that I was making. I shot this image probably five times, and mainly to get the tone and the lighting right and get the feel that I wanted to match that interior coziness of the shot before it. And then I realized that I forgot the silverware, all of it. And then I thought, well, that's OK, because what these pictures are really about is not inviting you to cook this food. They're not they're not pictures for a recipe, they're not pictures for a cookbook. What they really are is a way for me to access those t that time in my memory and my life and how it connects to my family. This next picture I've looked at so many times. My father sits the third from the left with his foot up in the air, smiling. And I had always assumed that this was a picture of a time where he was happy. He's super social, he loves to hang out with friends, and he just looks happy. And this is when the camera could lie, because in that fraction of a second he smiled, because he was relieved that he was sitting down. But really, when I asked him about the photograph, he said that this was one of the hardest times in his life. So he was in the army for two years. The first year was spent marching up and down an empty field in these boots. They, the young men weren't provided any socks, so they had to wrap towels around their feet. And they were in incredible pain, and on top of that, they were verbally abused and demoralized by the sergeants, who were also verbally abused and demoralized by their sergeants when they were in the same position. And he said it was really hard, and he said that 
There were a lot of suicides at that time that young men just couldn't bear it. So I was really surprised by this photograph. And when I thought of this food, and I just always assumed he was happy, so when I thought of the food that I would pair with it, it was this fish <laughs> called a vobla. And a vobla is like a dry salted fish that you eat. Um, you always spread it out in newspaper, you always wash it down with beer, and you always eat it with friends. And you tear off a piece and you pass it around, and it's just the type of food you share. And since my father is so social, I just assumed that this was, this was a food from my childhood. Actually, one of the foods, one of many foods that I was also incredibly embarrassed by, because this felt so Russian to me. So when American friends would come over, I was, it was just horrifying. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I paired these two pictures, and I wish I could speak articulately about why these two are together, but really, my intuition just says these two belong together. There's something about them that's linking them for me, and right now, I don't have the words to tell you why they belong together, and maybe eventually my consciousness will catch up and be able to give me the language to put it together, but um, I still think that my intuition guided me to put these two images together. And to take it full circle, um, back to my grandmother, where this idea, this book started, and when she talked about her time in the Soviet Union right after the revolution, and how she lived on this farm, and they grew all this food, and the government would come and collect all the food, and then redistribute it. So even though they had so much, they were left with very little. And she speaks so poetically about the food that they had to work with, and these really simple ingredients, that I wanted to make an image that really captured the tone of her love for these simple ingredients and all of the things that she did with them. And these were really the things that she cooked with, cabbage and beets and garlic and turnips, really simple ingredients that she did so much with. So looking back at this collection of photographs that I've made, and there's a lot more, when I look back at them, I see that there's a lot of loneliness in them. And they're a little sad. And I didn't really intend to do that when I set out to do this, but I wanted them to reflect memories. So it turns out that being a refugee kid was pretty hard. <laughs> and um, these pictures allowed me to express in images what I couldn't express in words. And my intuition guided me into all those places. So I'm really thankful. And thank you for letting me share them. So the next project that I'm going to talk to you about is also um, from mo moving from where I came from to where I live. I don't know if you remember the time when these signs were everywhere. Brown is the new green. They're all over the parks. The park where I lived and everywhere water conservation was on the mind, so I thought about how long the water was running when I brushed my teeth and washing the dishes and doing laundry, and I was just always top of mind. So when in 2016 it rained and the city came back to life, I was a little bit surprised. And this was the first thing that I noticed. And I noticed this tree on my dog walk. There's my little dog, Luna, in the corner. Um, I saw this, I passed this tree so many times but I never saw it, and all of a sudden I saw it and I couldn't unsee it, and it was so beautiful to me, and all I wanted to do was see it in a different way, because if you know the Panhandle, which is where this is, there's a homeless encampment to the left of it, and the park, it's gritty, so people sometimes leave trash around, and it's just not the most well-kept place at all times. So I just wanted to experience this tree in a way that I, I was wanting to see it in my mind. And I really wanted to put a black, big black backdrop behind it to isolate it and to keep it connected to the earth. And I had no idea how to do that. But at the same time, I was noticing that the city had come to life and there's blooms everywhere. So I gave myself a little assignment. I was gonna hike around the city in the morning and take pictures of what I saw in different neighborhoods. And I'd have a friend and a portable back, black backdrop and just go out and see what I found. Um, I gave myself some parameters, which was only natural light, morning light, city limits, and no botanical gardens, because that felt like cheating. <laughs> and I started really locally, so I found these poppies at the DMV. And these opium poppies are growing on Ashbury Street. And then I found this bush of scarlet ribbon protea in all stages of bloom on Page Street. All these things are all around me, but I just never paid attention to them. And then I got really weird and obsessed. 
and <laughs> I started hiking. And, and so I, I eventually collected over a hundred different blooms from neighborhoods from Glen Park to Telegraph Hill and was just delighted every time I captured one of these pictures. But being a city girl, never living, leaving the city most of my life, um, I didn't know what any of these plants were. I wasn't a plant person before I started this. And I also never really liked pictures of flowers <laughs> because I just thought they were a little boring and expected. But the way I was doing this for me allowed me to see the city in a new way. So I went to the Botanical Library and I started researching. And with the help of some incredibly generous librarians, I was able to identify all of the blooms that I shot. And I made some amazing discoveries. Brugmansia, which I found in Russian Hill, is highly toxic and it's used in uh, psychedelic uh, ritual ceremonies in South America. Some Americans found out about it and started using this, and they all ended up in the hospital in Florida, and now it's outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Romania, I might be pronouncing that wrong, it, I found in Buena Vista Park, and this is the largest of the poppy family, and they're also known as fire followers, and they're found growing mostly in burnt out areas. The foxglove, also very toxic. Uh, it has two other names, witch's glove and dead man's bells. Uh, but it has a compound on it that's extracted and it's used to treat epilepsy and uh, cardiac disease. And it supposedly influenced Van Gogh's yellow period because he was treated with this foxglove uh, for seizures. And dahlias, they're so beautiful. I saw so many of them. This one I found on Lake Street. And in this coded language of the Victorian time, a dahlia in a bouquet meant a symbol of eternal love. And the fuchsias found in Telegraph Hill have edible berries that you can make into jam. So I found this incredible wealth of information in all these little places right around me, but I still wanted to shoot that tree. And I felt like after a year of hiking around and doing this exercise, I was finally ready to do it. So I went to Home Depot and I bought some plumbing pipe and I ordered some fabric from Amazon and I fashioned a really janky frame. And I had got a couple of friends and they took it out to the panhandle and we got the shot. And I love this picture so much. And it had rained the year before even more. So every single bloom on that tree came up and it was incredible. So I knew I wanted to do this. I wanted to take pictures of trees this way. But I didn't know how, and I knew that my janky plumbing pipe situation wasn't going to get me very far. So again, I obsessively started asking people that I knew, how do I do this? And one day, when I was actually printing this photograph, um, I was asking the owner of the print shop if he knew anybody who could help me. And he said, actually, you're more in the world of film than photography, because you need a set built. So the man there printing photographs was a gaffer. And he introduced us, and we started working together. So now I build sets like this um, with a professional gaffer. But the parameters changed. The light's still the same. I want natural light because I just want one thing between you and that object that's so beautiful to take you out of, um, still keep you in nature, but really see, let you see the tree as an object. And then I had to measure trees all of a sudden because I had parameters in my height. So I had to learn how to use a clinometer, which measures skyscrapers. And I had some algebraic formulas to figure out the height. And I had to scout. And I had to uh, find these trees because trees are everywhere. But apparently, it's really hard to find a specific tree that fits these parameters. And I also needed permits or permission from landowners because this equipment's heavy and it's hard to get on the land. So. Yeah, so I did all of that, and now I'm here. That's what the <laughs> final picture looks like. And this is what I'm working on now. And I find it really interesting going through this exercise of making this talk for you guys how much I've learned and seeing where the intuition showed up for me. And what I realized last night, actually, was how much about relationships both of these projects are about. And I didn't realize that before, but the first one is a relationship between me and my experience as a refugee. And the second is my relationship to the place that I live and nature around me and really appreciating it in a different way. 
So because I let the intuition guide me into these places that I didn't know I could make, I feel really thankful for being able to make these images and reassured that I can continue on this path not knowing where I'm going. So thank you so much for letting me share my work with you. And yeah, thank you.